right. Thank you, Anna Marie. I'm going to share my screen here. So just a moment while I get set up. Okay, great. So I just want to confirm that you can see my slide there and it says video accessibility. Does that, does everybody see that? Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for coming today, everybody. Uh, my name is Gaby DeYoung, and I am a member of the IT accessibility team. And uh, today we are going to be presenting uh, video accessibility uh, to you. And along with me is Terrell Thompson, who's the manager of the IT accessibility team. So we will be presenting on topics related to video accessibility. So let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, who is impacted by an accessible video? So when we think about accessible video, we should be thinking about who will be impacted by inaccessible video. Um, so let's see. So in cer certain situations, there may be users who are unable to hear the audio. Um, maybe they're deaf or hard of hearing. Or maybe they're in a, a noisy situation and they, they're just not able to hear the uh, audio and they're, uh, it, that might be impacted. So the solution for that is to provide captions. And um, I'll be giving you some uh, information on enabling captions in different video platforms that are uh, available to the UW. And then also how to edit captions um, once your video has been uh, concluded. Uh, another thing to ask yourself is uh, uh, users who are unable to see the videos, which may include users who are blind or have visual impairments, or, or maybe somebody just um, is, is listening to the video um, instead of actually watching that. So the solution for these, um, these barriers would be audio description. And Terrell's going to talk more about um, audio descrip description and offer some solution solutions rather later on in the presentation um, regarding that. And then there may be users who are unable to both hear and see the audio and video, um, and that may be impacted. So the solution for this uh, group would be to provide a transcript. And um, transcripts are useful uh, because it allows uh, folks to jump uh, within the video to a certain place using keywords. Um, and they may be also be consumed by individuals who are using a screen reader or um, a braille device. Um, and there are other examples of individuals who may be impacted by inaccessible video. And those include folks um, who may not use a mouse. They use a keyboard only to navigate. Uh, maybe they're not able to, to hold a mouse in their hand or, or have uh, some weakness in their hand, so they're only able to use a keyboard. Um, or that may include folks who are using um, a screen reader to access information, um, and they're not able to, uh, to use a screen reader to access the video controls of a video player. Um, or folks are using speech input, such as uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking. So they use speech input to navigate around their computer. They, they uh, talk to their computer in order to, to perform certain um, uh, duties or uh, to, to dictate um, text into the computer. Or you may have folks who are dependent upon high crown trust or some custom color schemes. Um, and the solution to that would be to provide an accessible media player. And um, Terrell, again, is going to talk about an accessible uh, media player that uh, um, offers uh, playback in multiple languages. It also offers audio description, ASL interpretation. Um, and this uh, accessible media player was developed at uh, UW, and Terrell's going to cover more about that later. Um, and just for clarification, I wanted to um, include information about the different accessibility offices at the university and uh, what kind of responsibility they have when it comes to accessibility, uh, accessibility of videos. So if you have a student who has requested an accommodation, 
Disability Resources for Students, or DRS, will provide the funding and support for captioning and audio description uh, for course materials for that student. And Disability Services Office provides similar services for faculty, staff, and also visitors uh, to the university. Now, DSL also coordinates ASL interpretation and CART captioning for in-person and virtual events. So any requests for those kinds of services will need to go directly through DSO. And then Accessible Technology Services, um, or ATS, we provide internal grant funding for captioning high impact videos in a more proactive manner. Um, and we also provide training and support for UW departments with regards to accessible uh, IT. And I'll talk a little bit more about the grant funded captioning service more in depth later on in this presentation. Okay, so first um, I'm gonna cover captioning. Um, and I'm gonna cover captioning um, in Zoom, Panopto, and YouTube. But those are the three main video services that we use here um, at the U. And I'm gonna talk about how to enable um, automatic speech recognition. But it's important to note that automatic speech recognition captions or ASR, they may not be accurate enough to serve as an accommodation for people who depend on captions. And even though the accuracy is pretty good, um, ASR captions lack the ability to convey context of what's happening in the meeting. And sometimes it mislabels speakers. And then technical, medical, sometimes legal, and other specialized terms are often not transcribed accurately. Now, with that said, um, Zoom's ASR uses Otter AI as their speech-to-text translator, and it's pretty darn good. So in some situations, um, I've gotten some feedback that individuals actually prefer ASR over human captioners. So our recommendation is if you have an accommodation request to caption an event or a meeting, it may be appropriate to reach out to the individuals who have requested captions as an accommodation and ask if automatic captioning within the Zoom platform is acceptable to them. And if they say yes, then you can follow the steps for enabling the automatic captions and then you should be fine. Um, but if not, um, if, they do, if they do want to have a CART captioner, then you should make arrangements through uh, DSO to hire a human captioner. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm gonna first talk about enabling captions um, in Zoom. So by default, UW Zoom accounts have the ability to turn on automatically generated captions for your meeting or webinar. And you can check these settings or make changes when you're logged into your Zoom account um, through a web browser. Um, so uh, to turn on live captions in a Zoom meeting, you can look at the Zoom toolbar and the live transcript button will be visible to you as the meeting host. Now, if you click on that icon, then this little pop-up window appears as uh, shown on this, this slide. The slide is a um, uh, screenshot uh, of my Zoom instance, and I've clicked on the little CC trans, uh, live transcript button there. Um, and then uh, once you uh, click that, uh, then you can select the enable button under live transcription and also uh, check the checkbox next to allow participant uh, to request live transcriptions if you want to include that in what, as well. So incidentally, these are the exact same steps that you would take if somebody has requested an accommodation and you need to assign access for a human captioner. If you have a third party human captioner, it's usually somebody you may have requested through DRS or DSO to help caption the session. You'll select the button there that says copy API token. And that copies the token to your, the host or your, uh, your clipboard, and then you can paste it into the third party closed captioning tool, and then that will allow for the, the cart captioning to appear within your Zoom instance. And we have captions enabled for this webinar, um, and you're welcome to turn them on by clicking on the CC icon in the Zoom toolbar. And you can also view the uh, uh, transcript at the same time. And the transcript pops out on the right hand side. It also helps identify who is speaking. Okay, so I'm going to 
switch to my web browser for the next uh, few items and, and provide a demonstration of editing captions um, in your Zoom cloud recording. So once your meeting or webinar has ended, it's going to take some time to save the recording to the cloud. And when that process is complete, you're going to, to receive an email from Zoom with a link to that recording. Now, you can access that recording just by clicking on the link within the email, and that will prompt you to log into your Zoom account in a web browser. And that will take you directly to the cloud recording um, of, of, that, uh, uh, of that instance. Or you can access it by going uh, to the recordings um, tab within your Zoom instance. And so that's what I have up uh, here on, on, on my screen. Um, so a couple of different things I want to point out here. Um, this, uh, this link here down at the bottom where it says audio transcript, this is a live link. Um, and uh, so I mentioned that it takes a long time for video to save to the cloud. It takes even longer for uh, the transcript to save to the cloud. So if you get your, your first email from Zoom saying that your recording is complete, that's probably just going to be the video recording and not the transcript. So you need to wait a little bit longer until you get a second um, email from Zoom um, that states that the audio transcript is complete. If you click too early, then this, um, this link here will not be live and, and you won't actually have any um, um, captions to, um, to edit. So, but once that's uh, complete, then you can go ahead and click on this, click on your recording, and I'm going to open it up in a new tab here. And uh, it automatically starts playing, which is always distracting to me. Um, but this is the uh, caption editor within uh, the Zoom instance. Um, and you'll notice that the video takes the prominent position here in the center of the window, and then the, the transcript appears on the right-hand side. So usually what I do is I can click on this little um, CC button here. It says show subtitles. And then you can see that the captions um, actually appear in here. Now, I already started to, to work on this particular um, uh, video. Um, and it's pretty easy to edit the text um, of the transcript um, just by hovering your mouse over the word balloons. And you'll notice when I do that, this little pencil icon appears. And when I hover my mouse over that, um, it says edit. I'm going to make this a little bigger so you guys can see that. OK, great. Um, so when I click on that, then that um, allows me to make an edit within this word balloon. So I'm going to go ahead and make changes here. So I've made changes to my transcript and I have two different options. I can either select the checkbox and that will save my, uh, my changes, or I can click uh, the X and that will reject the changes and it will go back to the original text. But when I click on this checkbox here, I want, to, I want you guys to, to pay attention to something that will happen. Up in the upper middle of the screen here, there'll be some kind of a notification that says that the transcript has been updated. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that so you can see that. So I saved that, and then you can see here, transcript has been updated. So um, when you play this back, when you play the, the, the edited transcript back in your instance of uh, Zoom, those updates might not uh, appear um, instantaneously. But if you share the cloud link of the recording, that will have the, uh, the updated captions um, with any changes that you have made to the caption. Um, so, and it does take a little while, it may take a, a day or two uh, for your instance to update. So the captions on your instance will match the transcript that you have um, edited. Um, it takes a little while for that to, to happen, but it won't happen in real time in your instance. But the Zoom recording will uh, reflect those changes once you have made them. Okay. So that's pretty much it for Zoom. Um, so I'm going to switch platforms and then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about Panopto. This is another video recording option that we have at the, the University of Washington. And in order to enable automatic captioning within your Panopto videos, um, you could do that pretty easily. You'll notice that if I hover my mouse over the video, I get these little buttons set up here. 
I can select the settings button and that opens this up in a, in a different kind of a preview. And I have another uh, left-hand navigation menu here. If I select captions, then I have this request captions um, option. It's a drop-down option. And if I select the drop-down, you'll see the very first option there is uh, automatic machine captions. And that's what you will be selecting. Now I have a bunch of different options down here. I do a lot of um, sending videos to be captioned by, by um, other third-party um, uh, caption services. Um, and so you won't see this huge list of different um, um, services or different, essentially these are budget numbers that uh, will pay for the captioning. Um, and that's done by human captioners. So they actually go in and the humans will caption um, uh, uh, the, the videos for you, but that's a for fee process. So, but the automatic machine captions will be free and you can select that. Um, and then it, again, it takes a little while for those captions uh, to appear in your, in your Panopto instance. Um, but when they do, you can go back to your video um, and then you can make um, any necessary changes within the, um, the caption editor in Panopto. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this video instance here, which also automatically starts playing, which is very distracting. Um, so here we have the Panopto um, uh, caption editor. Actually, it's a video editor where I can also work on captions as well. So I've got the main video, which um, is the center of my screen here. Um, and then I have my slides down at the bottom. On this left-hand navigation, I'm going to go ahead and set captions. And when I do that, then you can actually see um, the transcript uh, with the timestamp but I'm not really able to make any changes yet. So in order to make changes, I need to select this edit tool, this little pencil tool um, up in the upper uh, right-hand corner. And when I select that, and my view is gonna change here, I'm gonna select captions again. And this time I can go ahead and click into these little word bubbles and make my changes. Okay, great. So um, once you have made all your changes to your caption file, then you can click apply and then that will uh, save all the changes to the cloud um, and then your caption file will be updated. An interesting thing that I noticed, um, if you do not hit the apply button, um, but uh, you have made changes to your transcript and you edit or, or you exit out of the Panopto caption editor, it will still save whatever changes you have made in your transcript as a draft, but it doesn't publish it to the cloud yet. Um, so which is kind of nice. So uh, if you have a long video and you, you know, you need to come back to it, but you don't want to apply uh, the changes to the entire caption file, um, you can make the changes, exit out of your browser, come back, your changes will still be there. Once everything is done, you can go ahead and, and hit apply, then that will make uh, the changes to your uh, cloud recording of your caption file. Um, and then everybody, everything will be revealed from there. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to YouTube. So um, in YouTube, uh, when you upload your videos to, to YouTube Studio, um, captions are automatically generated um, using ASR. You don't have to do anything. They just, that just automatically, automatically happens once you upload your videos to the YouTube platform. Now, um, just like in Zoom, it takes a while for the video itself to upload, and then it takes um, another while for the caption, uh, the automatic captions to be uploaded as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look here at uh, a, a video file that I have um, in my instance here. Um, and when you first upload your video and you're, you're wanting to add captions, um, you'll notice this live link here that says duplicate and edit. And when you first upload your file, this will actually say add, um, A-D-D. -D. And if you click on that, 
then that will give you the option to either upload a transcript that has already been created, or you can start typing um, uh, a caption, the captions for that video. Um, so it hasn't actually uploaded the automatic captions yet. It will just give you the opportunity to include them um, on your own or start manually typing them. But this was uploaded on September 29th of 2021, so it's been here a while. So uh, my captions, uh, my automatic captions should already be there. So I'm going to go ahead and select this uh, duplicate and edit. Um, and this is the uh, uh, caption editor within YouTube Studio. You notice that uh, video shows uh, appears here on the right hand side. And then we have the captions um, transcript rather that appears on the left hand side. Now I want to uh, select this link here that says edit timings. And when I select that, then you can see that um, the transcripts turns into more word bubbles with timestamps of when these words will be uh, will appear on uh, on the video player. Um, something else that you may notice, let's see if I can make this bigger. Oops. Yeah, that's not so great. Okay. Um, something else that you may notice is that there are word blocks that appear in the timeline. And right below the word blocks are um, is a waveform of the audio uh, of, uh, of the text that is being spoken. So if you need to make any adjustments to the timestamps of when the captions appear on screen, you can really easily do that just by sliding um, these text blocks around. Um, and then it's super easy also to make any changes uh, to the text in, um, in the caption edit editor for YouTube. Um, you also have the option if you're working on longer videos to save drafts. Um, and then once you have completed uh, editing your entire transcript, then you want to uh, select the publish button and then that will send your live captions, um, uh, sorry, send your updated captions uh, to the cloud version of your YouTube video. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the uh, for the uh, uh, caption editors. But sometimes automated captions just aren't that great. Um, maybe a lot of technical terms were used during a presentation and they weren't transcribed accurately, or maybe there were several speakers um, in a webinar or a meeting and automatic captions aren't identifying who's speaking at the right time. It could be other factors, maybe a noisy environment, all kinds of factors. So um, I wanted to include this slide as a friendly reminder about the UWIT captioning service. Um, Accessible Technology Services manages this project and will caption UW video presentations um, without any charge. But there is an application um, and applications are reviewed by ATS staff. Um, and these the, the videos that we caption um, do have a criteria. So they need to be highly visible, forward facing, high impact, usually um, multiple use and maybe strategic videos as well. So we have quite a bit of funding, uh, especially for captioning Panopto videos uh, for this. So I highly encourage folks to apply for this service. Um, and I've included a link uh, for the, the, the service here on this slide as well. Um, for other videos, uh, maybe outside of Panopto, Zoom, or, or YouTube, uh, although those could be considered as well, you might want to consider using the state contract uh, with 3Play Media um, if you don't want to use automatic captions and you don't have the time to, to edit those captions yourself. You can pay uh, 3Play Media and it's $1.95 a minute uh, for our contract with 3Play Media. Okay, um, so this slide <clears throat> is just a screenshot of uh, from a, um, uh, a third party captioning service um, and it lists a bunch of different file types. Um, these are all standard file types used by popular media players. Um, but of course, there, there are a bunch of different ones. Um, uh, Facebook, SRT, SMI, um, SRT seems to be a very um, popular file name or file type rather. But the purpose of this slide is uh, for you to know that it's important to know what file, fi file format your video player supports as that really determines the file type that you're gonna choose. 
And then this slide just shows the format, um, and in this case, a file format of a, of a caption file. In this case, this is a web VTT file, caption file. And it's just simple text with uh, timestamps and, and colons and, and whatnot. And these caption files can easily be edited in something such as Notepad++. You don't really need a, a, a caption editor to, to edit these files, but it, it sure does make things a lot simpler. Um, so something to keep in mind if you're using um, a, a text editor to, to edit your caption files, it's really easy to make a mistake, which could, can, which could throw off um, your timing and your captions for the rest of the video. So uh, just something to be aware of. And which videos are the highest priority when it comes to deciding, you know, which videos should you caption? Well, certainly videos that are required viewing for individuals who need an accommodation would be a high priority for captioning, but also videos that are likely to be required viewing for individuals who need an, a, a, an accommodation should also be considered. Um, so thinking what their needs may be. Other videos to consider um, include ones that are popular, viewed a lot, uh, videos that are relatively new, and captioning could be part of your workflow um, in videos that provide uh, critical content. So how do you prioritize your videos for captioning? Uh, well, I'm going to actually hand it over to Terrell at this point, and he is going to talk to you more about that. Thanks, Gaby. And before we uh, do uh, switch speakers here. I just wonder if anybody has any questions about captioning because I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool that we have to help prioritize captioning efforts, but mostly I'm going to shift gears and start talking about audio description. So now would be the time if you have any caption, caption related questions. There was one in chat, by the way, that uh, questioning whether automated captioning is enabled um, Within, within Zoom, if it is enabled by a host, whether um, all participants see captions right away or do they need to click the CC button. And I, I tend to always be host or co-host in meetings where captions are provided. Um, and so I don't know if I have the, the answer to that, but there is some discussion in the chat about that. I know that uh, I think that the user has to click the CC button to see. Um, and that there is a notice that gets sent out to everybody saying uh, live transcript captions are available. Um, and it sounds like Andrea is confirming that that is um, the case. Any other questions uh, about captions before we move on to other stuff? And feel free to either raise your hand or uh, type in chat, or we're a pretty small group, so feel free to just uh, unmute and talk if you prefer that. If not, then I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, I have a, actually I have a slide that shows uh, this tool, um, YouTube Caption Auditor, YTCA, is a tool that we developed. It's free, it's open source. And this is the report or set of reports that it generates. Um, and so we, we actually have a site uh, hosted on our department's server um, uh, that uh, you all have access to if you are a YouTube channel owner and you want to uh, participate in this to just sort of use this tool to, to see how YouTube channels at the UW are performing in terms of their captioning efforts, um, but primarily to um, use this tool to prioritize your own captioning efforts, then this is a really great tool for that. Uh, it's protected by UW Net ID, and so um, basically you just have to ask me and I can um, give you access to it. But I encourage anybody who has uh, some ownership responsibilities for your YouTube channel um, to, um, to use this tool and and take advantage of, of this. Um, as it says here, we have uh, 88 YouTube channels. These are known channels. I suspect there are many more um, out there. And some of these are kind of seem to be dormant. They haven't been updated in a while. Um, but 
Uh, one thing we can do is we can sort this table. It shows us all of those channels, how many videos they have, when their latest video was uploaded, uh, how many how many of the videos are captioned, and what percentage that is, as well as a few other things which are customizable. You can select what fields are shown in this table. But uh, I particularly am interested in um, you know how are folks doing on their captioning efforts, and this is color coded, and so you can see. Um, yeah, the rows that are red are zero captions. So those are channels that need to kind of get their act together. They haven't started their captioning yet. Um, and whereas green rows indicate a channel that has captioned 50% or more. And so if we focus on the positive and sort this in, in descending order, then we see that there are quite a few green rows. These are channels, again, that have captioning 50% or more. Several are over 80%, uh, three are over 90%, and one is 100%. UW School of Public Health has done a great job. Uh, with 176 videos, they've captioned all of those, and we can click on any channel to see you know, what's been happening with that. And we actually see over time, Kind of how this has progressed. They they actually had attained 100% um, in 2019 um, and maintained that in 2020. But then they uploaded a few videos that were not initially captioned. But then recently they caught up and have captioned those videos as well. Um, this is also an accessible chart, um, so you can uh, you know look ch check out what accessible data visualizations look like. It has a Sonify graph button, so you can listen to this graph. Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is using high charts. Um, so that's off topic, but you know this is a really cool app for, for taking a look at accessible data visualization. Um, further down on the page, you see a list of all 176 videos, and this too can be sorted however you like. Um, it, so it's not, not going to be very helpful in this case because everything is captioned. But if we go back and we look for uh, a slightly less perfect example, like I'm gonna pick on the iSchool, for example, um, they're at 48%, so just shy of 50%. We um, can kind of see you know, that they, they've never attained 100%. They got a little bit closer in 2021, but then they got a little bit farther apart. Um, so, but the, the way that this is really helpful for prioritization is you can sort, I think probably the most logical way to sort would be to sort by views. And then you get the most popular videos um, on your channel um, emerging to the top. And as we see here, you know, it initially looked pretty bad. They had a lot of no's for caption. They actually have done a pretty good job. If we base, you know, we look at the highest priority being, you know, those um, videos that are viewed most frequently then they have captioned most of their, uh, their high traffic videos. The number one exception uh, with 24,000 views is the Bachelor of Science in Informatics program overview, which sounds like a pretty important video. And so that, you know, this, this tool then allows that to surface and we, you know, they can, they can say, oh, that, that really needs to be um, captioned. It's a high priority video that slipped through the cracks. You can also sort by date. So you get the most uh, recent videos emerging to the top. And in that case, the most recent video, although it hasn't been viewed a whole lot, it is their most recent video. Um, it's only a four minute video, but it has not been captioned. And so, so this tool, just by you know, seeing all the videos in a context where YouTube doesn't really present them anywhere in a, in a way that's this easy to just kind of look through and see what's captioned, what's not, sort it a few different ways, and, um, and then, you know, take it from there. So this also can be a really useful tool for prioritizing your audio description. And so... That's what uh, I want to turn my attention to now. And I'm actually going to reshare because I forgot to check that little share sound button. And I've got some sound to share. Um, so what is audio description? Uh, Gaby talked a little bit about this, but it essentially, if you think about captions being a solution for people that are unable to hear the video's audio, 
Audio description is a solution for people who are unable to see the video's video. So they may be able to listen to the, the audio, um, and in some cases, they get most or even all of the content when they do that. But if there's any content that is communicated by uh, video alone and listening to the video is not sufficient to get that information, then that's a barrier and that needs to be remedied somehow. So audio description provides a solution um, to that. Um, and this is a solution post-production. So you've already created a video, you didn't add in that narration that would have made that accessible. Or if it's a, a lecture, um, you know, the, the lecturer did not describe things that were happening visually, maybe didn't verbalize the content that's being shown on slides or, or gave a demonstration and didn't describe what they were doing. Those are all best practices. But if in the end you have a video um, that didn't happen, and so there's content that's inaccessible, then it needs to be added in after the fact. And so audio description is a way to do that. It is known by other, other names, sometimes a descriptive video or just, just description by itself. Um, and, and various other terms are used to describe this, but audio description seems to be the most common. Um, it has kind of emerged. There's also a term you should know about, uh, extended audio description, which is when audio description doesn't fit, if you've got content, you know, audio content constantly, somebody's always talking or there's always dialogue. And if you're gonna narrate something or describe something that's happening visually, there's no place to squeeze in that narration. Then extended audio description um, means that the video pauses at that moment while a description happens and then it resumes playback after, after the description is over. So that's a, kind of a common technique within audio description, extended audio description sometimes is necessary. So, uh, so about audio description, we wanna talk about um, uh, how to prioritize, um, which is basically kind of similar to, uh, to cap, uh, prioritizing your captioning efforts, um, but with some, some differences and how to describe. We're gonna talk about three different approaches and avoiding the need for audio description altogether. So first of all, prioritization. Um, the same um, sort of strategies for captioning and for audio description uh, apply. So, you know, look at your audience demographics. You know, who are you expecting to use this? Um, you know, is this a, is a video where you expect there to be people in the audience um, who are without sight? Um, then audio description is gonna be a priority. Uh, without hearing, then captioning is going to be a priority. Um, so that that sort of thing, but also then look at traffic, look at, at publication date, where ideally everything we produce now, today, you know, should be accessible out of the box. Um, and we can gradually, you know, the prioritization comes in when we're looking at our legacy stuff and wanting to go back and making all of that accessible. And then we have to sort of prioritize and, and gradually do that. Um, and if videos are on YouTube, then use this YTCA. And again, just reach out to me uh, if you'd like access to that. Um, the other thing that is unique about audio description as opposed to captioning um, generally is that um, there, all videos don't need description. Uh, it really depends on the nature of the content. Um, and if you watch the video with your eyes closed, the question is, can you access everything? Do you get all of the, the important ideas? Or is there information that you miss? Um, it's a high priority if nothing makes sense with audio alone. It's a medium priority if the vid video is generally understandable, but there are some critical details that are lost. And it's a low priority if some information is lost, but it really isn't critical information. Somebody gets the, you know, the general idea of, of this video um, just by listening to it. So, so I wanted to share a few videos um, just to kind of give you a sense of, of this and, and think about those priorities, high, medium, and low, and, um, and ask what priority is this? Um, so we'll start with uh, UW video, Together We Will.
and I think you're probably already getting the idea with this one, but if you, I encourage you to actually close your eyes as um, you're watching this video and just see what you come away with. So pretty powerful video, right? I mean, the music itself is powerful, but if you can't read that on-screen text, then you're, you're going to come away with probably a very different impression of what this video is all about than if you can read that on-screen text um, or see, see the visuals. Here's another example. This is the Best of UW 2016 um, video. Uh, there have actually been audio descriptions added on more recent years too, but this is uh, an example I've been using since 2016, and I, and I like it as an example, so I'm going to continue using it. But uh, it's kind of similar to the last one. Let's watch a little bit. So obviously both of these are high priority, right? Um, you don't get any content at all. Um, you get a nice musical score, but you have, you know, this, both of these videos really move me um, and make me proud to be a Husky, but there's no reason for somebody to be uh, proud to be a Husky watching this video if they can't see the content. Um, so this is actually one, um, it's a good example of how to deliver audio description. There is, this is on the president's blog back in 2016. This is that end of year video that I think every year gets produced, um, kind of highlighting all the, the great things that we accomplished in the past year. And uh, in this case, right next to the, the YouTube, uh, the embedded YouTube player in the president's blog, it says video is also available with audio description. And so you can then click the audio description link and that pulls up the described version on YouTube. So let's see what this is like with audio description. Words appear. Hashtag best of UW 2016, the Nobel medal next to David J. Tholis. 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics with President Obama. Mary Claire King, National Medal of Science. UW and Microsoft break record for DNA data storage. A collage of photos, inaugural Husky 100. So, um, Obviously, that's that's a much more accessible video now, and and anyone can be proud to be a husky, whether they can can see what's going on visually or not. Um, so um, let's move on to another example as we're thinking through priorities. Um, this is a video that we produced um, called "IT Accessibility: What Campus Leaders Have to Say." Um, let's check out a little bit of this. We are committed to the notion that everyone should have an opportunity to participate in higher education, whether it be from the learning perspective or the research perspective or an opportunity to work here at this institution. Uh, we benefit from that because we get to enjoy the talents uh, and the skills of those people who come in and also their perspective, which in many cases will be different from the perspective of others on campus. So accessibility becomes a very important value of the university. So, so what do you think? Is that a high priority, medium priority, low priority? And in the interest of time, I won't ask you to answer that, but think about that in your own mind. Um, I would classify that as a medium priority because um, it really is just talking heads. Everything that's said um, is, uh, you, you get that audibly. Um, but the key missing piece here is what, not, not what is said, but who's saying it. Um, that was Michael K. Young. Obviously, this is an old video, not the president of University of Washington anymore. But this video features a bunch of university presidents and CIOs and other IT leaders all talking about the importance of accessibility. And none of them are introduced 
you know, within the audio track, they don't introduce themselves and there's no narration that says who they are. And so it could just be anybody off the street talking. Um, and obviously you want to know who they are and what their affiliation is so that they have credibility. So this, this needs to be described then in order to have, uh, to be accessible. Uh, but it's a lesser priority than the, the previous examples we looked at, which were entirely inaccessible without description. Um, here's another example, another video that we produced. Um, let's check out a little bit of this. My name is Cheryl Bergstaller, and I direct Accessible Technology Services at the University of Washington. And through our Access Technology Center and other services, we're making sure that the IT that we develop, procure, and use at the University of Washington is accessible to all of our faculty, students, staff, and visitors. So um, I'll stop there, we could go on, but ev every person who speaks in this video, again, it's talking heads, um, kind of documentary style video, everybody introduces themselves and states their affiliation. So, um, so access is built in. In this case, uh, it's a low priority or actually a zero priority need for audio description because everything is communicated through the audio track. And so this is really kind of a, the best case scenario for upfront, you know, pre-production pre kind of designing and scripting the video. You know, think about integrating that in so you don't have to do audio description afterwards. But if in the end you do have to do audio description, then there are various ways to do that. And so I wanna talk about three of those. One is to hire a traditional audio description service provider. Uh, that's what happened in the best of UW video that we looked at um, that was sent out to an audio description house. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what, the, what services they provide. Uh, second, you could hire a captioning vendor. So it's actually the same as hiring a traditional audio description service provider, but it is, uh, uh, companies that have traditionally been in the captioning space, um, like 3Play Media and Automatic Sync, they are now doing audio description in addition to captioning. Um, they do it a little bit differently, um, but, but that, that can be an option as well. Um, or the third option is to do it yourself using a timed text file. Uh, so the first approach, um, hire a traditional description provider, um, we actually, a few years ago, so this is a little bit dated, but we, we started with a directory of uh, audio description service providers that is published by the American Council of the Blind. And they, they have about 100 service providers listed. And many of those are focused on live production description, um, theater events and that sort of thing. Um, and others, uh, at least at the time that we did this, were very sort of local in the services that they provided. Um, and they, they didn't work a whole lot on a more national or global scope and didn't work a lot with, um, or at all, with post-production video, making video uh, accessible with audio description. So we, we kind of narrowed the scope down to uh, a, a, about a dozen or maybe a couple dozen uh, providers and then we sent surveys out to all of them to kind of get a sense for how much do they charge, you know, what is their turnaround time and, and you know, various other things and tried to get a sense of who would be a good fit for us in higher education, knowing, you know, the sort of videos we, we have and what our needs are like. And from all that, we narrowed the list down to seven providers. Um, and actually, as of today, that's six uh, because one of those bought out the other, I just uh, just learned. Um, 3 Play Media has now uh, acquired Caption Max, so Caption Max is no longer on the table. Um, but uh, but anyway, our on our Making Video Accessible page, uh, there's a list of providers, so it's a short list. Um, what happens when you send to a traditional audio description provider is they will uh, script the, the audio description, they then do the narration with professional voiceover talent, they professionally mix it in. So they lower the volumes as they're speaking, they raise the volumes afterward and so forth and, and do that kind of seamlessly. So it all sounds um, good. And then uh, the, the typical deliverable from them 
is an audio described version of the video. So then you've got one version with description, one version without, and you cross reference the two, which is what happened on the president's blog. There's that link to the audio described version. Uh, the typical price range uh, for that service is 10 to $15 a minute. Um, that does depend on complexity um, and extended description where the video has to be paused does uh, cost a little bit more um, generally. So um, here again, it's just, just a screenshot of that um, uh, Best of UW 2016 video with the link to the audio described version. So that's, you know, that's how that would be delivered uh, if you did it that way. The second approach is to hire a captioning vendor. Again, 3Play Media does this, Automatic Sync does this. We have the, the state contract with 3Play Media for captioning. And so um, basically for them, it's an add-on service. So you get a video captioned and then you additionally check the box that said, it says, I also want audio description with this. Um, it's $7.50 per minute as their standard rates and $11 a minute for extended. So a little bit cheaper for the description itself, although you have to get it captioned. That's a, that's a requirement. Um, even if you've already gotten it captioned, you still have to get it captioned. Um, so, uh, so the lower cost is a little bit um, nebulous because you do have that upfront cost for, for captioning as well. Um, the reason that they have that requirement, by the way, is that they're using a semi-automated process for figuring out where the description will fit and they use the data that they produce in the captioning process in order to inform that. And so, um, so that, you know, I've, I've lobbied to get the two services separated, but they explained to me that that's why they, they currently are um, connected and necessarily connected. Uh, the output, this is a unique thing too, is that the output uses synthesized speech. So it's not human voiceover talent. It is a speech synthesizer. Um, and uh, while that, you know, for a dramatic production, um, you know, consumers uh, prefer research shows, uh, they prefer a human narrator, but that preference kind of goes away when we're talking about academic content. They just want description, you know, um, of any sort in order to access their, their academic content. Um, a, a typical deliverable, uh, again, is an audio described version of the video. So you get two versions, uh, one with description, one without, but there are lots of other choices too. Um, about a dozen different choices of ways that you can, you can get this uh, description. Uh, here's an example of the three play media dashboard where you, we've uploaded uh, a, a file to be captioned. And then these are optional services that we can, we can add. So we, we check the box that says audio description, and then we choose, is it a standard description? Is it extended description? Maybe we don't know. And so we, we pick the choose for me box and let them decide, in which case we have to have, you know, uh, it's a flexible um, uh, spending plan then. It may cost us 750 per minute, or it may cost us 11, depending on what they choose. And then we've also got higher prices for expedited or rushed jobs. And lots of options actually from 3Play on audio description. So you can choose different speakers' voices since this is all synthesized. You can choose uh, the, the English speaking rate, slow, medium, or fast. And in making those choices, you, there are samples that you can listen to to figure out what the best fit is. Um, and lots of choices for output. Um, the third option is to use a WebVTT file. This is uh, what Gaby described for, for captioning. It's the, actually the exact same kind of file. Um, and instead of captioning text, that file would include description text. So basically you've got a start time and an end time with some specific syntax. You have to write it out in a precise way. And then the, the content in between that start time and end time is the text that you want to be verbalized at that moment. And so if we take our IT accessibility campus leaders video, um, I've actually updated this. So it, it's got Anamari Kase listed as the president instead of Michael Young, but, um, but it, you know, it's the name, of the, the name of the person, their affiliation for uh, each time the description needs to happen. 
So this is the kind of thing that's really easy to do. You can do it in any text editor. Um, uh, you know, open up Notepad, type in your description text, make sure that you've got the web VTT syntax right. Um, and, you know, grab the start time and end time just from your media player. Really easy to do this on your own. Um, doesn't cost a thing other than a little bit of time, you know, one minute, two minutes, and you've got your audio description. And um, it then, it, it's super easy. It then... It, it, this is actually built into the HTML5 specification. And so with this tag, the track tag with kind equals descriptions pointing to the VTT file, it, this is how HTML5 is sort of, uh, this is how descriptions are expected to be delivered or HTML has, has built in a way to deliver descriptions. Um, you only need one video then and extended audio description can be automatic. It can be built into the playback so that um, uh, it just automatically pauses um, rather than having to create an entirely separate video that does that, that pausing. So the problem is it's not supported at all. None of the browsers built in media players support it. Um, so the only place you have support for this is in Able Player, which is a, a media player that we developed. Um, it is free and it's open source um, and it's out there. Uh, there's a WordPress plugin, there's a Drupal module, uh, although both of those are in early stages of development. So, um, so it's kind of a work in progress, um, but, but it does make it possible um, to deliver description using this method and to write your own description. Um, the one caveat though is that if, if it's more than a kind of a low or maybe a medium priority uh, description job where you really need to describe things more eloquently, um, like in those first two examples we saw, that's something that probably should be sent out to the experts because audio description is an art. People spend a lot of years learning to do this, learning you know what words to say to describe something. And... Um, that's not something that the people who have not been sufficiently trained should be should be really dabbling with. So it's more for you know I've just got this this one piece of content um, that you know is visual. It's not uh, there's it's, there's no audio alternative. Um, I need to describe just that. You can do it really quickly. Um, you know with this approach. Um, I should also point out. I actually this is not in my slides, but I Gaby uh, doing the Panopto demo reminded me that. Um, this is now possible in Panopto, that in the same place where you could click on captions, you can also click on audio descriptions. And at any point in the video where there's something that needs to be described, you can type in a description and then the user can turn it on on the player with the audio description, there's an enable audio descriptions and an enable captions button. Um, let me just... Uh, at the risk of embarrassing myself with this homemade video, or I was just experimenting, I'm going to play just a little bit to show you what this is like. Terrell presenting from his home office with a backdrop of Chinese art. And then we've got a lot of just kind of messing this. around until about three, shot. about 33 seconds. Terrell moved his head around in circles while the camera tries to maintain focus. It's four o'clock. So that's what, what that is all about. Um, and we are right at four o'clock. And uh, my last slide here is just a bunch of uh, links to various things about both captioning and um, audio description. And these slides are going to be available afterwards on the, the webinars archive page. Um, so... I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I know we want to end on time, but just want to see if there are any questions before we adjourn. There was, um, there was one question in the chat, um, and it's from Morgan, and it says, is there a requirement like ADA compliance to caption all videos or provide other accommodations? Are there different standards for internal videos? And then, um, and then they actually found the link and posted it. It's from 3Play Media. And then they also posted a, a, a quote saying, public entities, including state and local governments in both internal and external video communication. 
But I'm wondering if you have anything else you might want to add to that. Yeah, just that, um, I mean, we are uh, required by state policy 188 um, and by our, by our own internal policy that kind of echoes that to comply with the W3C's web content accessibility guidelines 2.1 level 2A. And, and that does include a requirement that uh, videos be captioned and audio described. Audio description is actually built into that as well. And so, um, so, so anything that's public um, should be a priority for, for being made accessible. And that's you know, um, something we really need to be focusing on. We're not doing very much audio description at all. And captioning, although we're seeing a lot more of that, that's fallen pretty short too. For accommodations, if you got things that are behind passwords, course materials, and so forth, that uh, that students need to access, then disability resources for students will step in, and they will make those those materials accessible. Um, but it's more the public things that we really need to be paying attention to, and and prioritizing. Um, you know that things that get a lot of traffic or things that are new and might get a lot of traffic, <coughs> those all need to be made accessible. And, and Harvard is a really high profile case. Harvard and MIT were both sued by the National Association of the Deaf because they had so much uh, really, you know, uh, good, good content that was publicly available and was not accessible. And so that they've really had to do a lot of work to, to catch up on that. All the meeting tools. <clears throat> Hi, Tara. Uh, could you also put the link for the accessible visualization in the chat? Yeah, that that was um, it's behind uh, UW Net ID. So, but that was part of the YTCA application. Mm -hmm. But I actually am am working on making a public version of that um, so everybody can access it. But I I'll share that with you, Sushil. Yeah, yeah, and also if you let, I'll send you a message if you let me know when it's permanent. I want to use it in a paper. I'm working on a paper on Miro. So okay. this would be a good example from our own school. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah well, let's stay in touch. If I can comment that the YTCA tool is extremely helpful in figuring out what you need, what the high priority videos are. And for us in the School of Public Health, we had something like 45 COVID webinars one hour. So there's a lot of volume and we we're down two staff members, so it was really a challenge to get back. But we, we built, essentially built it into our workflow. So now we should uh, have 100% of our videos um, captioned. It just, there's a little bit of lag in, in when those things are posted. But I thank you so much for that tool. It's super helpful. Yeah, and thank you and congratulations on attaining 100%. That's quite a, quite a milestone with so many videos in particular. All right. Well, thanks everybody for for coming today. Um, really, really great to have have you all. And um, yeah, stay tuned for more um, accessible tech webinars. This time every month. <laughs>